Friends, let's begin in song. Will you rise in body or in spirit? Let's sing number 346. Come sing a song with me. morning. I'm Jim Mariner, your service associate, and I'm joined today by the Raven David Schwartz, minister of our sibling congregation in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. It's a pulpit exchange Sunday with our Reverend Lydia Ferrante Roseberry at that congregation and Reverend David here. Julie Morris is on the piano, and Mary Stackpole is our hymn leader today. On our tech team, we have Larry Sherwood, and Deborah Mensch, and Don Price. As I say the welcome words today, I invite those of you on Zoom to Uh, to shift into gallery mode, if you haven't already uh, done so, and scroll through the screens so you can experience the beauty of this congregation. Those in person, look around. See who you uh, is next to you and who you can recognize. I'm new enough here that I, even I can recognize some people. <laughs> you are all welcome here today. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, skin tones, shapes, and sizes that come together in the uniqueness, you are welcome here today. In all the ways you experience and express gender, 
you are welcome here today. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here today. In all the ways you make your living and the places you are from, you are welcome here today. And with all the traditions that inform your spiritual life, you are welcome here today. No matter how long you are away, nor how soon you will return, you are welcome here today. You, whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears, you are welcome here today, and you are invited to join us with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands. We welcome you all here today. We acknowledge that the land surrounding us is the stolen territory of the Arapaho people and that many native people roamed freely on this land for millennia long before the arrival of white settlers. We commit ourselves to being a center for spiritual exploration, justice making, and to anti-racism and anti-oppression work within and beyond our congregation. If you are new here, we are glad you have found us and hope that in this community, whether you're with us in person or virtually, you can experience the warmth and love of this congregation. Each Sunday is different here, so please come back for of several times to really get to know us. We have many opportunities during the week for social connections and spiritual growth. Those on Zoom can check out the links in the chat to help you get connected. Those in person can find our newcomer form on the QR code in your hymnal in the back of the hymnal, or stop by the welcome desk, uh, and, or a turn, um, I should have put my glasses on. <laughs> I'll try that, I'll try that again. <laughs> well, I've, well, I've got them, I just, I just. <laughs> Those in person uh, can find our uh, newcomer form on the QR code in the back of the hymnal or stop by the welcome table in our foyer to get connected. Everyone on Zoom is welcome to stay for uh, a casual conversation following the service in the uh, fellowship room or attend the inquire series which starts about 15 minutes following the service here. If you are here in person, you are welcome to coffee hour in the fellowship hall. Finally, uh, if any new visitors on Zoom would like to introduce yourselves in the chat, please do so. We'd love to know who is among us. Those in the sanctuary, please take a moment and greet your neighbor. I always, I always feel badly cutting this off. It's like, no, stop being nice and having relationships with each other. Friends, it's awfully good to be here. It's good to see some of you again, folks who I've met through loop events in Longmont or stuff that's happened uh, down the street at the UU Church of Boulder, and it's good to meet a lot of you for the first time also. If you have a chalice at home, you can light it with me as Jim lights our fellowship chalice. And so we know where we all are. Right in the chat, what town are you lighting from? Will you say the words with me as we light our chalice this morning? 
We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. And now as I ring our bowl again, I invite you to draw deeper into this present moment, to arrive, to let your spirit catch up with your body in this house and deepen into this beloved community. Reverend David told me that one thing he and Lydia say to each other just about every time they meet is the old phrase that Senator Paul Wellstone used to, uh, to often repeat. We all do better when we all do better. That's true for our two congregations. We are, as a community, we, we keep working to be healthier and more welcoming. We keep working to live out our values and make our commitment to justice in the real world. And when we do that, we don't just build up this congregation, we build up liberal religion in all the way up and down the front range. Both of these congregations are part of something bigger. No one of us is alone as an individual. We flourish in a community that's part of why we're here now. And no one of our congregation is alone. We too flourish in a community. In March, kids from both congregations will be part of the Our Whole Lives sexual education program, which we've taken the lead in organizing. In April, Reverend David will host a Passover Seder for both churches. In June, our two congregations will host a booth at the Boulder Pride together. We all do better when we all do better. Whatever difference there may be between us, we are united in a shared way of doing things, doing religion, which even in the liberal Boulder com community remains counter-cultural. Each of us individually and all of us together are united in a shared search for meaning. We may call it by different names and speak of it with different stories, but in this house, and each one of our congregations, we are rooted in direct experience and of the transcendent. We are informed by history and inspired by a multitude of understanding. We are welcoming of critical reasoning, which also calls us to get out of our heads and into the world to make justice. And we are rooted, nourished, and nurturing of our always interdependent, interdependent community. We all do better when we all do better. Will you rise in body or spirit as you are able to sing together hymn number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal, Blue Boat Home? 1064. i 
y'all sound really good. <laughs> it's nice to sing with you. I always, before going to lead worship at a, a new church for the first time, I ask, in this case, I ask Karen, like, what, what's it like? Do they laugh? Do they, like, do they make noise? Like, yes, amen, any of that? And before coming out to Colorado about a year and a half ago now, I served, I served in co-ministry with my wife, Reverend Terry, who's also a UU minister, and I think gonna come here later this spring, at a church on the south side of Chicago. So I'm used to people making noise. I'm not used to the very staid, quiet Unitarians who experience no emotion. I'm not used to that anymore. In Chicago, whole long stretches of the lakefront, because the whole city's right up against the lake, you know, whole long stretches of the lakefront are just concrete walls. I, I mean, literally, to prevent erosion, you got a concrete wall, and it goes back a little, and you got a higher concrete wall, and it goes back a little. If you're lucky, you got a third concrete wall, and that's the lakefront. Sitting there once, watching the lake, I saw this optical illusion that didn't make sense to me at first. I saw these waves coming in towards me, sitting on this concrete wall, and then I also saw waves going back out again, which, of course, is just that I, I'm used to seashores where the waves come in and that's sort of the end of the story, but, but the waves were bouncing off the wall, just like the echo of my voice is bouncing off the back wall of this room and coming back again. I was watching this happen wondering how far off into the middle of Lake Michigan did these things still go? How far did that wave bounce back? They did not bounce as far as the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. The Marshall Islands are 3,000 miles northwest of Australia, and they were settled four millennia ago by people who traveled there in canoes across hundreds of miles of open ocean. The journalist Kim Tingley in this marvelous article called Secrets of the Wave Riders writes about the Marshall Islands, writes about what it is to navigate in those islands. They say 70 square miles of land that's it, that's the whole Marshall Islands, 70 square miles of land. Five islands, 29 atolls, rings of coral islets that grew up around the rims of underwater volcanoes, now encircle gentle lagoons. These little green dots and donuts make up two parallel, more or less, north-south island chains separated from their nearest neighbor by 100 miles or more on average. And the thing is that swells, these giant ocean waves, these ocean crossing waves, swells generated by distant storms in Alaska, Antarctica, California, Indonesia. They travel thousands of miles across open ocean to these little spits of low-lying land. And when they hit, part of their energy is reflected back out to sea again in arcs, just like I saw on that concrete wall in Chicago. It's reflected back out again, and then another part of it sort of curls around the island or atoll and makes this chop in its wake. Wave piloting, wave piloting, wave navigating is the art of reading by sight and by feel these patterns in the waves, of feeling the reflected wave that's bounced back off again, of feeling and seeing the chop that lets you know you're in the wake of an island 50 miles back that way. Detecting the minute differences in what to the untutored eye looks no more meaningful than a washing machine cycle. Detecting that allows a remetto, a person of the sea in Marshallese, a remetto to determine where the nearest solid ground is and how far off it lies, long, long before it's visible. Which is to say, though it was nearly lost when US nuclear tests made the last 
of the wave pilot islands uninhabitable, there is a traditional Marshallese practice of training navigators not to look at stars or sun, but to feel in their bodies the tiny, regular sensations of reflected waves that have bounced off of distant islands. To feel among all the other waves in the ocean, among the wind and the sensations of your body and movement and chaos, the slow and almost imperceptible beat underneath all of that of a wave bouncing off cliffs and beach. In 2012, two physicists looking for dark energy and the Higgs boson heard about remetos, heard about these people who'd learned how to do with their bodies what the physicists were trying to do mathematically and experimentally, trying to find a subtle wave underneath all the chaos and noise of the universe. So these guys went to the marshals and they talked and they traveled at length with a remetto whose grandfather had taught him how to feel the backbone wave, the foundation wave that ran in between these two parallel lines of atolls, ran between it like a road. He said his grandfather had taught him to feel this wave by taking him to a reef and laying him down on his back in a canoe blindfolded and then dragging him around among the coral to feel in his body the different sensations of the waves bouncing underneath until bit by bit he came to feel it. Perhaps then, in every ocean sailors travel invisible roads with a guidepost that leads back to every island, every atoll, every rock, a thread that can lead them home to safety through the maze of the ocean, a compass so subtle and so quiet that no one but the wave pilots found it because no one knew where to look. At the UU Church of Boulder, our pledge drive kicks off next week. We're a little behind y'all. For us, like for you, it's the pledges from members and friends that make up by far the largest part of our budget. Fundraising is not the work we exist as churches to do. I do not have a Mercedes or gold shoes. <laughs> but it is the work that we do to make the church possible so that we can exist as an organization and carry out our missions. In that spirit, let me invite Carolyn Elliott to share why this congregation is important to her. I'll get there, I promise I won't trip. <laughs> I know I look like that sometimes, but I won't. Reverend David, thank you for reminding us to be well tuned in to Mother Nature. Um, she's a good teacher. Oops. Oh, there. Hello. Good morning. Finding a spiritual home requires the use of strong intuition and clear analysis together. The first time I walked into our former sanctuary, now our fellowship hall, and read the writing literally on the walls, the phrase, bringing love and reason to life to create a just and compassionate world, completely captured my whole being. Tears came out of my eyes, and my psychic self felt completely at home. I thought, sign me up. My contributions of time, Money and abilities are merely extensions of what my heart, mind, and soul feel here in this place and with you, all of you. I'm spiritually moved every Sunday and every time I interact with each of you. I grow in all aspects 
of my spirit. Helping economically advances my growth and that of all of us. We get to learn and contemplate more things and take action as we see fit. The lights won't pay for themselves and our minister and staff should not have to volunteer themselves. We must bring love and reason to life to create a just and compassionate world right here in our own yard. That includes the spectacular music Tad and crew bring us every week. And by the way, Tad and his ever lovely wife Emily are in Alabama doing a concert. <sighs> and thank you Carmen for your playing and Mary for singing. Julie, my bad, got it. Personally, music is a soul language to me. In this sacred space of our sanctuary, music is vital for us to bring love and reason to life to create this world. Not only do I pledge every month, but I also contribute to our Brinkman Music Fund. Sheet music doesn't grow on trees, although yeah, the paper, but you know what I mean. Money is not a dirty word. It is merely a tool we may use ethically to create a just and compassionate world. I cannot imagine my life without our blessed and sacred community. And I choose to put my money where my mouth is. Thank you. Each week, we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives and this community by giving half of our plate away to those organizations that share our values. Today, the half plate is for the Together, Church, uh, Together Colorado, of which our congregation is a member. It is a nonpartisan, multiracial, multi-faith, an anti-racist community organization. Together, Colorado has trained and mentored fellowship members to organize for a society where all can thrive. For 10 years as Boulder Valley Community Action Network, we have advocated for access to mental health care and our hard work is making a difference. Boulder County responded by allocating millions of dollars for crisis response, culturally appropriate services, and mental health navigators. We are now at the table to create a behavioral health roadmap to address the cracks in the system. And we invite you to visit the Together Colorado table during the coffee time where you can learn more and share your stories and concern. You can text your donations at the number on the screen, or if you are in at the fellowship today, place a donation in the offering plate as it passes among you. Please give generously as you so often do. As our musical reflection begins, we invite you to reflect upon and write into the chat, if you're on Zoom, your answer to this question. What grounds you or supports or sustains you when life feels be bewildering? The Quaker author Parker Palmer writes that there was a time when farmers on the Great Plains at the first sign of a blizzard would run a rope from the back door out to the barn. They all knew stories of people who had wandered off and been frozen to death having lost sight of home in a whiteout while still in their backyards. Today, says Parker Palmer, today we live in a blizzard of another sort, 
it swirls around us as economic injustice and ecological ruin, as physical and spiritual violence and their inevitable outcome, war. It swirls within us as fear and frenzy, greed and deceit, and indifference to the suffering of others. We all know stories of people who have wandered off into this madness and been separated from their own souls, losing their moral bearings. And they make headlines because they take so many people down with them. Lost ones come from every walk of life, clergy and corporate executives, politicians, people on the street, celebrities, school children. Some of us fear that we or those we love will be lost in that storm. And some of us are lost at this moment, trying to find the way home. Some of us are lost without knowing it. And the church at its best is a home in the storm. It's a whiteout out there, and so we take a rope out into the dangerous chaos so we can find our way back again. We're all gonna get lost. We will all fall short. Every one of us, we will all fall short of our own hopes of integrity. But when we have the rope, we can find our way home. That's what the word religion means at its roots, one meaning religio, the ties that bind one to another, to our ideals, to our resolve and we stay connected because we know the storm can be more than we bear alone. In 2006, an increasingly long time ago, my wife and I finished seminary in Boston and we moved out to Minnesota, Terry and I. She to do an internship at a Unitarian church in St. Paul and I went to work at Target's headquarters, Target's headquarters out in Minneapolis. I did, I worked in HR, I did learning and development for, you know, for the income, for the health insurance. And f for a while, certainly as I was getting the job, as we were moving out there for the first few months, for a while, that job was just sort of a placeholder. You know, that, that was a thing to do until Terry finished her work and I went on to my internship and kept moving towards ministry. My destination was clear, the path was obvious. That's foreshadowing. In that first year, I was wrapped up in the work of the place. There were always interesting people to work with and interesting problems to solve and there was travel and big budgets and my own ambition, which I had not even known was there. I got in touch with this secret type A side of myself that I never admitted to myself. In my whole life I, I had said, you don't have to compete, just win. Yet, <laughs> that is tight. Mm, mm. <laughs> but the work was full and it was busy and there was always one more project and one more deadline. Do y'all know about leveling up? It's like in, you're playing a video game and there's one more item to collect, there's one more side quest to solve, there's one more boss to beat, and chasing these, chasing this one after another, you fall into the game and then you realize you should have gone to bed like four hours ago. Yeah, some of you know. <laughs> and my my destination, my plan, ministry, I mean this was there, but it was obscured by the sort of white out of a storm of busy meeting schedules and deadlines and project plans, so many spreadsheets. And there I was, incredibly lucky, I mean just dumb lucky to know what I wanted to be when I grew up and discovering firsthand the blizzard that keeps you from moving towards it. And and I'm not saying you can't like work a job and keep your soul. I'm saying for me in that moment, what was happening for me was this distance growing between my insides and my outsides, right? This distance between a sense of who 
I wanted to be and who I actually was practicing becoming in the world every day. You probably know that feeling too. I was walking to the bus one day after work on a spring afternoon and I heard a song that I had listened to a hundred times before. But in that moment, in that moment of chance or grace, I don't know the difference, the gap between the inner life and the outer life all of a sudden was visible to me again. I was nine months into the job. I was leveling up steadily. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I realized, oh, wait a minute. This is not what I am in Minnesota to do. <laughs> Which is not fundamentally about a call to ministry. This is, this, actually, this is not a story about me at all. This is a call to all of us in different ways and shapes and times, a call to live an undivided life, not to separate self from soul in this swirling storm of the world. And you've had these experiences too, right? Maybe in earth-shaking encounters with the holy, maybe in that little scrap of music that reminds you, oh, wait a minute. Maybe in prayer or meditation, maybe working in the garden, maybe listening to a dear friend share their life, maybe lighting candles, maybe marching in the street. You've been called home to yourself time and again in this life. There's a thread you follow, writes the poet William Stafford. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. There's a thread you follow it goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread because it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die. You suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. What is that thread for you? Which guides you safe through the maze of the world? What is that thread? How do you find it? After Minnesota, and before moving out here two summers ago, Terry and I served a Unitarian church in Chicago that was built as a miniature Gothic cathedral in the 1920s. It was 50 feet tall and 100 feet long and 25 feet wide, and it was beautiful and it was a terrible building to have church in. <laughs> you were very wise to build this instead. <laughs> Because it's, uh, you're, you're like in a, you're in an airplane, you know? The closest person to me when I preached was about like, like where you guys are sitting back there right now. It was beautiful and difficult, but that's not the story. The story is on the front facade of this church, way up high, just below where the roof comes together in that tall point on the outside, was the symbol of a cross inside an astrolabe. So a cross, because they were Christian Unitarians in the 20s when they built the place, but an astrolabe, how many of you know what an astrolabe is? All right, this is, there were like six hands and that was a much higher proportion than I expected. So astrolabes are like a GPS of the ancient world. They were invented by the classical Greeks and they were used throughout the Mediterranean and Islamic world for 1,500 years. So an astrolabe is a flat circle with an elaborate set of measurements on it and then a second arc of metal perpendicular to the first one. And what you do is you hold this thing flat to the horizon. Say you're out at sea, right? You hold it level to the horizon and then you, you take the measurement, you take the angle of a fixed point at a fixed time. So like the sun at noon. What's the angle of the sun at noon? If you're on the equator, of course, the sun at noon is gonna be directly overhead, but if you're up here or anywhere that's not the equator, 
depending on the time of year, you've got to do a little bit of calculating, but if you know the time of year and you know the angle of the sun overhead, you know how far north or south you are compared to the equator. So you don't know how far east or west you are, but at least you know how far north or south you are, and you can do a lot of navigating that way. Thank you for coming to this episode of Preachers Explain Old Inventions. <laughs> The, the people who built that church in the 20s didn't put the astrolabe in the most prominent position of the facade just because it's a clever discovery. It's there as a reminder that through all the storms and the chaos of life, through the world where things are complex and complicated and volatile and uncertain, we have tools to find our way home. If you're lost at sea, you can reorient your life to a larger reality. You can find your position by looking at the sun and stars, by finding those things that don't change, even as everything around them changes. You have tools to point you on the way. And look, like, like using an astrolabe, you don't automatically know where you are all the time. It requires a quality of attention and focus and discernment is what this is in traditional language to figure out where you are and where you're trying to get to. That's what we're doing. That's what you do in this house week after week. Practice paying attention in the quiet stillness of this place so that we can go out into the storm and practice it there too. We quiet our bodies and our minds to listen to the still small voice of conscience whose story is so simple and gentle as to be entirely missed in the noise of living. Whose invitation is to grow your spirit and help to heal the world. And then the work of your whole life gets to be figuring out what does that actually mean for you? And how do you choose to do it over and over and over again? That's practice. It's what you do singing, you practice that. It's what you do in the stones in a few minutes, you practice that. It's what you do greeting each other warmly in the morning, you practice that. A constant choosing of what story are we gonna belong to The folk singer Pete Seeger tells the story of seeing uh, in the early days of the Vietnam War a lone Quaker protester late one night in the dark holding a sign on a corner entirely ignored by the world walking by. And he asks this guy, what are you doing? How are, what is changing? What is the point of this? How are you gonna change the world with one sign on an empty corner and the young man paused and straightened and said, I am here to make sure the world does not change me. That's the work we're doing here. It's paying attention to who are you becoming and are you choosing it? Will we listen with our whole bodies, with every bit of ourselves, our spirits, to feel for that wave hidden underneath the noise of the world, the one which points to safe harbor, it's practice. It's practice. And in that sense, in that frame, worship, this, this thing we do on Sunday morning, it's not something done for you, it's something done by you, it's active. Y'all are working at least as hard as me right now. We come to church to listen, and I don't just mean to the preacher or the musicians. We come to church to listen, to practice it, finding that still small voice of conscience, of compassion, of love, that call of love, which is like a lighthouse steering us safe through darkness, which we hear in each other, voices of wisdom and experience of difference and diversity, 
voices of human beings with the same fear, compassion, and pain. We come to church to listen to the holy, the voice of all being, of life itself, whatever that larger love is that holds us. I'm so much less interested in the name than the experience of looking for and finding that thing. We tend to our interior life exactly so that we can live in the world and help each other heal it. And we come into this house to sing and pray and learn and tell stories and fellowship and drink coffee and raise money and take out the garbage and change the light bulbs. I mean, we do all of this stuff to invest each other, invest our lives into each other as a community, to create something, to weave the real substance of the congregation, which is that relationship and that shared seeking. There is no consoling certainty in this work. Tragedies happen. People get old and die, it stinks. And that's what we signed up for in living too. Out on the open sea, you can't feel what the island will be like when you arrive there, what life you'll have when you follow that thread. You don't know who it is exactly. You'll become who you're becoming. You can only listen with your whole body and spirit, listen through the chaos of the ocean for the hidden wave that's gonna guide you to solid life. That's the life you're invited into, and I have no idea where that will take you. But I know that it won't steer you wrong. I heard a Norwegian fairy tale in which the hero comes to a crossroads, and three paths lie ahead, and each is labeled handily, because it's a fairy tale, with with what's gonna happen if you follow that road. And one path is marked, travel down this road and you'll return to this place unharmed. And the second path is marked, travel down this road and you may or may not return. And the third is marked, travel down this road and you will never return. And of course, uh, of course, in the fairy tale, our hero chooses the third path, never to return. How else can you discover the outcome of your journey unless it leads to a place and a person you have not yet been? That's what we're doing practicing, paying attention, listening for the backbone wave underneath all the noise, the wave that points to solid ground, the road that leads you home, the thread you follow. We listen and we choose it over and over again, following love's lead. Amen. Friends, will you rise and body your spirit? Let's sing it together. This is not a naive thing we're doing. We know that days are dark with storms and burdens weigh our heart and trouble waits at every turn and, and we know we can go on. Will you rise and body your spirit? Let's sing this together, this, this new song. So this is new to many of us. Many of us. It's in our teal hymnal. The number is 1015. I know I can. Since it's a little new, I'll sing through it once to help you get the tune in your ear. And then all together, we'll sing through verses one, two, and four. Troubles wait at end. 
Friends, will you take a breath with me? And another, slower. I invite us into this time of community connection, a time of sacred sharing. Today, as I stand here before you, your minister, Reverend Lydia, is behind the pulpit at the UU Church of Boulder. (laughs) The 11 o'clock service starts in just about four minutes for them up the road, and I can imagine and feel so clearly the bustle of that place before the service starts. Our two congregations have a long history, and it is a history of rupture and of repair and relationship. Our lives as Unitarian Universalist congregations in Boulder County are woven together. We share the same roots beginning in the carriage house as the first fellowship in 1948. We share the principles and the values of Unitarian Universalism. We've co-created so many things together, programs and events, feasts and festivals. And we share similar rituals. Today at UUCB, members of my congregation come forward at this point in the service and they place stones in a tray of earth. They share their joys and concerns with each other. They weave their lives together. They experience in ritual like we do in this house an outward movement of something happening on the inside, a connection a gardening of our spirits, training and tending ourselves to move through the world with care and compassion, with hearts that know how to open to each other and know how to ask for help. Reverend Lydia brought some of the stones from this congregation to our basket of stones in Boulder. And I've got stones here from UECB amidst yours at the fellowship now in the hope that our shared journey may continue to bear fruit. Well, if you're on Zoom and would like to share a joy or a concern, please type into the chat window, send it to everyone. Let us know what's on your heart today and I'll read what you share. And Jim will add a stone to our sacred waters on your behalf. If you're in the sanctuary today, come on up front. If You feel so moved, share your joy or your concern using the microphone and add a stone to the water or add one in silence. Wherever you are, please tell us your name and where you live when you share. Please come forward as you feel moved.
Will you join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation? Let's begin with a breath all together. Spirit of life and love, we arrive in this house carrying with us all of who we are, bringing into this moment the best of our hopes and intentions and also the baggage of all those places where we've fallen short of the people that we want to be and become. In this moment, our hope and our prayer is for gentleness and for compassion, that we turn that towards each other, extending that to one another. And remembering that in order to do it, we have to begin with ourselves and turn that care and compassion inwards to recognize that we don't turn into people who love each other by beating up on ourself, and that no amount of words of grace and compassion and care can take root unless we also plant them inside our own hearts. And so with tenderness, with care, we put an arm around our own shoulders. Offering love to ourself too. That it may grow and bear fruit in the life that we live. In the way that we're present to each other. In the way that we follow the thread through everything that happens. Be together in silence. Each Sunday after the service, we have an inquirers class for newcomers and current members. Drop in to any or all of our sessions to learn more about this congregation. This Sunday is Meet Your Fellowship Leaders, and next week will be on UU History, Principles and Sources. We meet each Sunday after the service at about 11.30, uh, to 1215, right here in the, in the sanctuary. One question I didn't ask was how long are your services typically? <laughs> so I can plead, uh, I can plead guest if this is late. I'm going to keep my benediction to 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> no. Friends, will you join me in these words for extinguishing the chalice? We extinguish the chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, nor the energy of action. 
These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. Go out into this bright and beautiful world, following as your compass heading always, love. Go in peace and amen.